Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I think we're ready to get started. Welcome to the Hispanic Heritage Month panel discussion, BCC Latinos and their journey towards success. Um, this is the last event um, of the month, sponsored by the Hispanic Heritage Committee. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit today, um, our panelists today are going to talk a little bit about their personal journey to the United States and the road that led them to BCC. Um, first, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Livia Newbert, and I was, it's my honor to be here today um, to introduce and moderate this panel, introduce the panelists and moderate the panel. I am the coordinator for the ESL program here at BCC. And um, I would like to now introduce you to our panelists. First, we have Mr. Mario Garcia Rios right here from Mexico. He is an associate professor of biochemistry. Um, next, we have Everelis Santana. She is also an associate professor, but in math. Um, and she is representing Puerto Rico. Um, next, we have Ana Gallat representing Argentina. And she is one of our vice presidents of academic affairs here at BCC. Next, we have, did I say it right? No. Oh. Um, Tahis Riel Martins. She is um, representing Panama. Panama. And uh, she is the coordinator of academic computer in our New Bedford campus. And last but not least, we have um, Rosario Basse. Did I say it right? Yes. Uh, representing Peru and she's um, an associate professor of economics. So we're gonna, we have five questions uh, that we have put together for our panelists today. Um, they're each gonna have approximately three minutes to answer you know, each one of the questions. Then we would like to have some time at the end for uh, Q&A. So let's get started because we know that we all have very busy schedules. Um, so we're gonna start with um, asking our panelists to please tell us a little bit about their cultural background and what brought them to the United States. So I go first, okay. Can you guys hear me, everyone? Do you want to pick up the Loud microphone? enough? Is that better? Yes. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm supposed to be teaching chemistry right now, so I told my students I'll be a little late. My dean knows now the rest of the administration <laughs> knows. <laughs> but this is much more fun than being there. No, just kidding. I actually enjoy teaching chemistry very much. And uh, I guess the question was how I came to the U.S. Yes, uh, just tell us a little bit about you're from Mexico originally okay. and what brought you to the United okay. States. So I was born and raised in a northern city of Mexico, which is about 150 miles south of the U.S. Texas, uh, Mexico border. Uh, I, I tell you that because Mexico, as the other countries that you're going to hear about, is fairly diverse also. And uh, northern Mexico has a lot of influence from the U.S. in uh, not only the food, but in some of the customs. I mean, we have, believe it or not, American football. Uh, I, I grew up uh, going to my university's uh, football games, well, soccer, but also American football. So that's something that surprises people. And I'm not a fan, but some people are big fans of the Dallas Cowboys because they bordered the country, of course. Uh, finally, my uncle claims to be the oldest Mexican-born fan of the New England Patriots. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that is true, but that's how much influence there is in, in, in Mexico from the U.S. Now, um, I went to school there for my undergraduate degree at a, a university primarily um, oriented towards engineering. And then um, on my third year of college, I met my wife of now th almost 30 years. She is from Minnesota, born and raised, completely gringo, if I may. Uh, and she was visiting Mexico with her family. She was 16 years old. 
I was uh, 19. And uh, I guess it was meant to be. So after about five years of uh, corresponding by letters, I mean, she came back to Mexico a couple of times to visit. Uh, we ended up getting married. We have two daughters who were born in Indiana when we were in graduate school. So that was my path to the U.S. by marriage. Now, it's str strangely enough, my grandfather on my mom's side was born in Texas. Mm. So he's a U.S. citizen by birth. My mom is a U.S. citizen by her father. But I was born a Mexican citizen with no U.S. citizenship until, oh. of course, I got married. All right. So that's essentially more or less the answer to that question. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, I was born and raised in Puerto Rico, and um, I went to college there. I did a degree in mathematics and computational mathematics. Um, and then I came to the U.S. to do graduate work in mathematics. And once I came here, I guess I met an American as well. <laughs> And we were dating in grad school. Once we finished grad school, we um, got married. And I guess the prospects of jobs for both of us were better here in the US. So we decided to stay here. Um, I think my, my husband kind of tricked me. He always told me and my mom that we might go back to Puerto Rico, but he was lying along. So now we're here, and I have two kids, and they're born here. And that's my story. Hi, good morning, thanks for coming. Um, I was born and raised in Buenos Aires, the capital of Argentina, uh, but most of my studies and my kind of growing up in was done in the western part of the country, that is at the border between Argentina and Chile. Um, I did my undergrad and part of my grad work at the Buenos Aires University, and then I had the opportunity to come to UMass Amherst to do my PhD. I did, and while I was working in my PhD program, I got offered a teaching position at Greenfield Community College, so I became a full-time faculty member in Greenfield. From there, I moved to administration, then we had two years living in Long Island, then eight years living in Michigan, and I'm back in Massachusetts, so it's kind of like a homecoming for me. I just started working here, but it's kind of like a full circle. My daughter was born in Springfield, and the two of us now live in New Bedford, and um, well, that's the story. Hello, my name is Thais Real Martins. Um, I'm from Panama. And the reason why I moved to United States is because uh, I was married to an American. And he, he was in the Army. And the Army was a, have a big presence in Panama when they were building the Panama Canal. Mm -hmm. So, and since I remember, since I was maybe five or six years old, I always, always liked blue eyes so <laughs> <laughs> so i cannot tell you more about the story but <laughs> i married an american i moved to united states because he wants to go back to his family that was from new bedford and then we moved here and then i have my two kids here uh, and one of my daughters is here at bcc she's in the criminal justice program here at bcc uh, so that's why i moved to united states Hello, my name is Rosario, and I am from Lima, Peru. Uh, as I was listening to the stories, I was remembering uh, a joke my parents used to tell my sisters that also went abroad for their graduate studies, and they, they told them their, um, that they were getting their master's degree, but instead of a master, they were getting a mister. <laughs> <laughs> so they were also marrying. Um, but in my case, it was a little different. I married in Peru. I had my, my child there. I remember um, after my undergraduate studies of economics in Lima, I got accepted at Brown University. And as I was planning to come, I changed my mind and I married and a long time passed. And I thought I would never uh, continue my plans of graduate studies, but it actually happened, and sometimes out of a personal crisis, you find the reasons why, the things that you did, never did and completed, and it, they were always in your heart, so that was my case. 
and I, got a, uh, I was fortunate to get a scholarship from the World Bank to study my Master's of Economics here at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee, where I stayed for my PhD also. So that was my, my trip. Thank you, wonderful stories. Um, we're, gonna now, uh, we're now gonna move to our second question. Um, do you think that being Latino puts you at an advantage or hinders you when it comes to competing for and succeeding in leadership positions? I go first again, I guess. Hmm. I, I guess I never mentioned the city where I was born, uh, Monterrey. Um, I, I just didn't mention it, I'm sorry. It's the third largest city in the country, mm -hmm. just to put things in the perspective of my friends here. Um, I guess it's hard to tell. I never really paid attention too much to whether or not uh, being Hispanic or Latino or whatever other term there is to describe uh, people who originated in, I guess, the Iberian Peninsula, to some extent, is a plus or a minus. Uh, maybe uh, on occasion is actually a plus. I, I wanna go and modify the question a little bit. Rather than answering for leadership, let me tell you what I did during graduate school. And that was, this was a personal choice. So when I was in grad school, there were many opportunities to apply for fellowships and, uh, and other type of scholarships, uh, some of them for minorities mm -hmm. and some of them for just the general public. I made a commitment at that time that I was gonna compete just for the general public applications and it was conscious. I, I, I did not want to apply for anything labeled for minorities. I don't know why that, that was because now that I have two daughters, I encourage, encourage them to apply for anything and everything. If if, he's, if he has a label or he doesn't have a label, it doesn't matter. Just apply for things. When your perspective changes, of course, you know you see things differently. Uh, I was awarded a fellowship by the McKnight Foundation, and to this day, I wonder if it was because I was qualified or maybe because of my ethnic background. Mm -hmm. It really is not fair to the rest of the population in some ways. It, it, th that uh, sometimes that's the way it goes. I also worked uh, 13 years in Texas, South Texas, that is, is not like Dallas or San Antonio or Houston. Um, Texas is a very interesting place to live, so I, I, that's a whole other panel, by the way. <laughs> but uh, and I, I probably wouldn't be too positive about it. But anyway, that's another story. Uh, the reason I mentioned Texas is because when I was there, there was a lawsuit by a non-minority student of the University of Texas at Austin who could not get into the law school. Uh, her last name was Hopwood, and it became a famous case of reverse discrimination, if you will. So I'm, I'm, I'm going too long on this question, but it's, it's, it's just I, I don't have a definitive answer as far as how I feel. Maybe I'll get some um, feedback from my colleagues here, but that's essentially that's okay. what I can tell you. So I, I think being a Latino in the US definitely puts um, people, uh, I think it hinders them from getting positions of leadership. Um, first of all, People think that if you have an accent, you are not smart enough. So they want to pick a leadership, a leader that is uh, smart, right? So no, that person is not as smart. No, I don't think so. Second of all, people tend to pick uh, leaders that represent the majority of the group. And in my case, in the academia and definitely in the math field, uh, being a Latino, it's very, you know, it doesn't happen very often. So I don't look like my colleagues most of the time. So I think since I don't really represent them, or they might think I don't really represent them, it might be conscious or unconscious, but I think that puts me in a, in a 
more of the disadvantage. Um, they might think also because you come from a different culture, you might not know how to navigate the workplace, building relationships with other colleges or even the industry or how to navigate the social aspect and networking um, just because you come from a different culture. And the fact is that many of us have been here for a long, long time and we are you know, very attuned with what happens or not. So that, that's my personal opinion. Thank you. Well, I'm kind of along the lines with Mario in that I cannot say clearly it's a positive or it's a negative. It depends on the situation and it depends on what you do with the situation. It, my motto is better ask for forgiveness than for permission. I usually tend to just go and do it, but that is me, it's not being Hispanic, it's just my personality. And that's one key thing, and it's gonna echo in my response on the upcoming questions. There's not a one size fits all in Hispanics any more than there is in African Americans or in Asians, or there isn't one description. So depending on where you are and depending on what you do, that label can be a plus or a minus, but it's a lot of it is what you do with it and like Mario said, I encourage my daughter now to look into things that are highlighted for minorities, like women in engineering or Hispanic, because if that opens a door for you, why not use it? But the reality is, that doesn't define me, that doesn't define her. So from where I stand, I can say that sometimes it was a hindrance, sometimes it was an advantage but it's not a definite one-size-fits-all. Very interesting answers. Hello. Um, in my case, um, I cannot say that being uh, a Latina put me in disadvantage or any advantage. I really don't see it like that. Um, I feel that when I moved to the United States, I my English was very limited, I can say that. I studied English in Panama for more than 10 years. But when you study a foreign language, if you don't, when you move to a country and you don't practice that language, it's like nothing. And maybe you have taken Spanish classes here, but if you move to Panama, you are gonna find like, I cannot speak this language, because you have to practice that language every single day. You have to have that contact. So that happened to me when I moved to United States. You know, I studied English for 10 years. I knew the grammar, I knew the writing, but the conversation was not there. So I have to, to really work really hard to study English, to come here to this amazing college. You know, I was in the ESL program here at BCC. And I have to work really hard because when I move here, I already have a career. You know, I have a bachelor's degree in administration, and I really want my career back, but I have to work hard to learn the language here. But I didn't feel that I have a disadvantage. What I feel that I have to work hard myself to get, to get into that, to get my career back. So, but yes, you have to prove yourself more because you are a minority. You cannot change that. You are a minority. You, you have to prove yourself more. When I applied for positions here at BCC, I knew that I was a little bit in disadvantage compared to the other candidates because I was a minority, because my, my uh, English was my second language. So I have to work harder you know, to be prepared for that position, to be applying for that position. And even though that I didn't get that position. I didn't get discouraged about it. I work harder and I, you know, I apply again and again and again and again until I got it. <laughs> I never stop. I never get discouraged. You know, I'm, I'm the kind of person like Anna said, my personality is like that. I don't get discouraged. If I, someone said not to me, that means that, okay, I need to work harder and maybe another door is gonna open. And if that door gets closed, another door is going to open. And if that one gets closed, another one is going to go. So I never stop. So that has to do with your personality, too. So that's my, that's my personal opinion. 
Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I think I agree with a lot of the comments that have been said here in terms of being a little bit of um, uh, no confusion, but um, feelings that being Hispanic matters for, for uh, being a good or, or not good leader. Uh, but I think that I also agree with Thais now when, when she says that she has to struggle hard to prove herself um, to society, to American society, let's say. I would say that in my case, that was the case also when I, maybe now that I go back, um, I remember in my master degree there were a lot of um, international students and that was very different. But when I entered the PhD in economics at Vanderbilt, there were mostly American students and Asian students. And the level of mathematics, for example, that was expected was really, really high. And uh, there was a stereotype uh, from if you were Latin America or African, for example, you were expected not to have the same level of mathematics and expertise. Or, so I remember having to work so much harder than anybody else so I could be seen as a leader at the same level as anybody else. But said that, I would say that being a woman also make a very big difference. So I guess gender and race, in that case, ethnicity is mixed. Because uh, there were very few women in the program also. Um, so I think that somehow, yes, you have to struggle. Mm -hmm. And also, I think that being a leader in Latin America um, is very different than being a leader in the United States. And what is expected from a good leader is very different too. Mm -hmm. So somehow we can, we think that we can be, we're uh, getting there to be the best leaders we can, but that's according to our point of view, our perspective, and not necessarily what is expected from us from here. I think that's also a difference. Thank you, very good points. Um, could you now talk to us about some of the challenges that you have encountered as a Latino, Hispanic um, person and some of the lessons you have learned along the way? Um, um, I guess before I go to the question again, I feel like I leave you with incomplete stories. Of, yeah, I, I said something about the Hopwood, Hopwood case and I never told you what, what it was about. So very quickly, uh, the University of Texas at Austin had a, a quota for minority students to be admitted into the law, the law school. Uh, because of this Hopwood uh, lawsuit, uh, that quota ended. So they did away with having a certain percentage of the school open for Hispanics or Latinos, a certain percentage for uh, other minorities, etc. Uh, and, and then that had repercussions, uh, even probably to today. Um, now, and again, before going to the question, I, I, I wanted to comment on, 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 on something that happens in Latin America and perhaps in other parts of the world that I don't see happening in the U.S. yet. Many countries in South America have had women presidents. I cannot count them, but I think at least four or five, Argentina for sure. Uh, Brazil has Brazil. one. Yeah. So, I, 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 you know, in some ways, well, okay. So Let's that's not get story. into that. <laughs> yeah. So some of the limitations was the question that I have encountered. Um, some of the challenges, challenges and some of the lessons you've learned along the way. Um, I, I think through the many years from grad school to my first job in academia all the way to BCC, uh, I have found mostly people that were willing to help. Uh, I haven't really felt that um, that somebody doesn't want to lend a f helping hand because of my ethnicity. I do have one experience in Minnesota when um, when we moved there after my wife finished her undergraduate degree in Arizona. Um, 
uh, in this job, I, I did feel for the first time somewhat discriminated. Mm -hmm. I was in a position of uh, authority, if you will, over some non-minority people. And uh, one non-minority person did resent me, or did resent the fact that I was, you know, born and raised elsewhere, and I was actually his boss. Uh, and he was very open about it. It's the only one time in, again, 20 some years, 27 years of being in this country that I have felt that way. Uh, and it was, I mean, I still remember it, so it wasn't something um, very happy or something that I, uh, uh, I guess, recall with, with uh, I don't know, with, uh, yeah, with, with a positive feeling, exactly. Uh, mm -hmm. Challenges, just like for everybody else, you know, I mean, to get a, a, a master's or to a, get a PhD requires a lot of work, and I worked as hard as uh, my classmates. Uh, I did find that uh, many of my conversations late at night in grad school were with foreigners, not necessarily Hispanics or Latinos, but people from Ireland, from Russia, from all over the world. But that was because graduate school back then was attended my, mainly by non-US born uh, uh, students. I think that has changed. Uh, having said that, one of my best friends from uh, grad school happens to be somebody from Wisconsin. And, and he always lent a helping hand. But once again, uh, no real challenges that I could say they have hindered my, my, my path. Uh, rewards, the, the latest was to be hired by VCC, and oh. I'd say that in all honesty. I, I, uh, I couldn't be happier to be here. I did spend five years at an institution that I was not happy, and uh, I did my best, but it was, it was uh, um, this is one of the greatest things that, ha that has happened to me, uh, for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as I listen to my coworkers talk about this, I realize there's um, Latinos that have been born in the U.S. that are not represented here, so they might have a completely different story from us. Um, I know for a fact that um, if they were to be asked this question, they would say that since they were in school, in elementary school, they felt that because they were Latinos, they were at a disadvantage. Um, when I was in grad school, I met a lot of different Latinos and they commented that, you know, I, I applied to a, to a program, a summer program, my professor said, don't bother. I applied to grad school and my professor said, don't bother. Um, so I think uh, teachers have very powerful messages that they send to students. And if, if you're gonna be a teacher, be conscious about that. Um, but back to me and my story. Being Puerto Rico, I didn't feel any challenges whatsoever, right? Uh, but as I came to the US to uh, do grad school, I did feel that sometimes I was excluded from some social events. I think people might thought that I wouldn't have enjoyed some events, so they didn't invite me. On the other hand, you are always invi invited to go, uh, go dancing or, you know, <laughs> things that they associate with being a Hispanic. Um, I also thought that in, when we were forming groups in uh, some courses, the courses that are not from my field, I was doing math, so the courses that were not in my field, like some education courses and stuff, when you were forming groups, people tend not to pick you. So I think the reasons might be that they don't really know how they're gonna get along with you because you are different, um, or they might think that you're not smart enough because you are from a different country or you're, you know, English is your second language. So also, as students, be conscious about that. Um, I also noticed the same happen with other minority students in the classroom. Um, once I got to the workplace, I think the only 
challenge that I faced was that being a minor minority, you, since I am in a, in, a, in a field that is underrepresented by minorities, you feel like you have to be always at your 100% because you are representing the Latino uh, population. So if you do something bad, uh, some of your coworkers might think that all Latinos are going to be the same way. So that puts, I think, a, a special burden on you. Um, also, I think there's expectations that you're going to involve in any, every multicultural committee, every affirmative action initiative, <laughs> every Hispanic Heritage Month activity, and that puts a burden because you only have a finite amount of, a limited amount of time, right? to do your work, to be an effective teacher, and to be involved in college initiatives. So that leaves you with less time to spend your energy in other endeavors, right? Um, I think since this is not my first job, I was very conscious about it. And when I joined, I was quickly approached by some people to become part of the multicultural committee. And I purposely say no because I wanted to give myself an opportunity to grow in other areas. And although I feel very passionate about those issues and I'm most likely gonna join those, those committees um, at some point, I wanna uh, give myself an opportunity to, to grow in other areas and also see, the, uh, have the people to see that you have much more to offer because I think they might think that that's your only place in the college structure. And I, I want to, you know, let them know that we have much more to offer. So. Well, for me, as somebody that is horizontally impaired, um, <laughs> one size fits all doesn't really fit anybody. And it tracks into every facet. The biggest thing that I have found as an issue with the Latino Hispanic designation is there's the wrong perception that everybody that has any kind of connection with any Hispanic or Latino background, they're all the same, they all think the same, uh, they all like the same kind of music, that, and that's not the situation. And at times it wears thin when you're trying to get people to understand that no, tango is not my thing, and no, I don't like this and I don't like that, or I love this that is very American and is not Latino. So stereotypes and one-size-fits-all approaches, those tend to be, for me, the biggest pet peeve. Um, well, depending on where you are, you either try to help people understand the situation or you just gloss it over and move on. I'm not going to engage in a full discussion with a cashier at Stop and Shop, but I'm going to engage in a full kind of back and forth, um, let's talk about it, with somebody that I'm gonna be seeing every day. So it's not so much the hindrance, it's not so much the, well, it has done something negative to me, is that, well, H Hispanics and Latinos come from so many different backgrounds that uh, having that diversity within the diversity, it's something that has gone unexplored in many fronts. And, well, that's a lot of, what needs to happen in the future and treating each individual like an individual and not like well you are the token hispanic so it's the burden on you to represent all of them well no you are who you are and you represent yourself so those are probably my biggest pieces well i have a lot of challenges <laughs> i um my biggest challenge was to learn, you know, the English language when I moved here to the United States. Um, and because that I have to, even though that I, when I moved to the United States, I already have a career, I have to start from zero. And when I tell you that, it's because when I enrolled in the ESL program here at BCC, I was not the only one in that position. In my group, I have doctors, I have lawyers, it was me. All these people coming from other countries with careers, but because they didn't speak the language, they were there in the ESL program, and it was the most funniest group I ever had. We all with accents trying to speak English, so you can imagine that. 20 students from different countries 
with accent trying to speak English, that was a challenge. So <laughs> that was very, very, you know, that was a very good experience that I have here at BCC. Um, so that was my, my biggest challenge. But um, after I finished my ESL, um, my ESL program here at BCC, I have uh, the opportunity to work here too as a work study. And I have that opportunity because I said, if I do that, I'm going to start, um, I'm going to have the opportunity to start uh, practicing my conversation. So I got that position as a work study. And from there, I was hired as a part time. And then from there, someone said, do you want to help me out in the computer lab because you are very good with technology? And I said, yes, I can do that. And then someone said, can you help me out in the accounting? And I said, I never work in accounting, but if you train me, I can do accounting. They trained me for a week. I was hired in accounting. A uh, few years passed, and I said, Thais, do you, want to, do you want to work in administration? And I said, yes. <laughs> so, so I never say no to any opportunity. So, but just back to my challenge, it, that was one of the challenges that I have. Besides that was the challenge also. It was a little bit different from my, uh, my co-workers here. It was also was very hard for me to get used to, to the American culture. Because in Panama, family is really, really close. So being with family, it was so important to be together all the time, to call each other all the time, not to make appointments to go see my, my sister or make appointments to go see my aunt. You know, here you have to make appointments to see your family. So for me, like, really, I have to call to make an appointment to go see you? <laughs> so all these things, you know, it was different for me. Of course, the weather, driving in the snow, that was a big challenge. How many accidents I have, I cannot tell you, but I have few uh, that I have, you know, the weather was a big challenge. So the culture, it was a big, big shock for me. Now I get used to, you know, I love here. I love go back to Panama too. So, you know, now I get used to both culture. I enjoy being here. I enjoy when I go back to Panama. The weather is almost 89, 90 every, every day. So, and I love the weather here because I can wear different clothes, my boots and a scarf and all this stuff. So you look cute and all this stuff, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, but yes, back to my challenge again, sorry. It was my, my language. And I still, when I teach my face-to-face -face classes and I walk in the classroom and I say, hello, students, and I can see some faces like, okay, where she's coming from? I can see the faces <laughs> trying to figure out where she's coming from. And I said, uh, my first language is Spanish. I'm from Panama. And then, you know, they like, oh, okay. Because since I say, hello, students, I can see my student face like, where she's coming from? You know, because the accent. So that's a big challenge, too. When you are an instructor with an accent, the students, you, you see the reaction from some students, so that's a, and maybe you have that experience, um, you too. <laughs> so you see the reaction of the students looking at you like, uh, uh, okay. <laughs> but you know, you go, you overcome all these challenges. So and I enjoy. I've been here at BCC for many, many years, and I'm gonna retire here. So <laughs> I hope. <laughs> so he's not retire yet. <laughs> uh, uh, now that I'm listening to Thais, I'm, I'm laughing also because Thais helped me with my online class and definitely relates to the challenges of being a Latino and having an accent. Um, I'm recording my classes for my online class of economics and as I was recording, <laughs> so I wanted to be not very serious because, you know, probably as students, you know, that when you listen to a um, show in PowerPoint and it's narrated in a very serious voice or um, standard tone, it's very boring and you can just fall asleep. And so I was just trying to be a bit, and I, 
I said, oh, like the song Christmas is all around us, economics is all around us. And, so, <laughs> and then a student told me, what did you just say? That economics is around us? <laughs> So, and then Thais was just laughing because she said, yeah, it actually sounds like that. How could you ever say that? So, in any case, that's uh, in my face-to-face -face classes. Whenever there is, I always tell my students, if there is something that I'm explaining that you cannot understand, um, please ask. But all the time, I'm probably, mm, I focus on describing. Now, I said it, say one, uh, explain a concept once, and then I describe it again, just in case. Yeah? So I guess that's something that I didn't used to do, but since I'm teaching here, I, I'm always describing, giving extra descriptions of what I said. I guess that's, that's one of the, the lessons. Thank you very much. We have a couple more questions and we don't have a lot of time, so we're going to try to sure, move um, a little faster. Um, our next question is, do you think that social media accurately portrays the Lat Latino Hispanic culture? And if not, what do you think needs to be done differently? Social media. Social media. It's all around us. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> I, I do have an accent. Well, according to my nine-year-old daughter, 20 years, no, no, 10 years ago, I have an accident, not an accent. That's what she used to call it when she was little, uh, an accident. Um, well, I, so is Facebook and Twitter, is that what we're talking about as social Everything. media? Everything. Oh my gosh. Um, TV, oh, commercials. Okay, television, okay. Th that's a little bit better. Everything. Uh, I, m I do su subscribe to uh, Verizon service, mostly to the Spanish channels. So uh, I do not see it on an everyday basis how the non-Hispanic channels portray the Hispanic culture. Mm. I see everything from the, from the perspective of within the Hispanic world, because I watch those types of uh, channels all the time. I don't watch ABC. I listen to NPR, but uh, when it comes to TV, you know, well, when there's time, of course. Um, I think, do you guys know what is a telenovela? Mm -hmm. A soap opera? Some of the things that you see in soap operas in Spanish are not the reality of at least Mexico. You know, these are, these are uh, fantasy land uh, places where, uh, uh, you know, you don't see the real, in my case, a, a, a Mexican culture. So I guess it depends on where you go for your social media uh, outlet or uh, information. It's going to be somewhat biased, very biased, and very rarely accurate. Uh, even when you see National Geographic portraying, you know, life in Mexico City, you find some fascinating things that you didn't know about, in my case as a Mexican, but then you also find some stereotyping. So social media can be a source of uh, stereotyping. Um, the, the, the soap opera thing is that, uh, uh, you know, you, you look at Mexican soap operas and most people in the soap operas, when you see them, look European. They don't look like a Native American or like uh, uh, what you, what I would consider a real Mexican in my case. Uh, and so they portray this, this uh, s distortion of what is in reality uh, a country with 70% people living almost in poverty. Hmm. So I, I think if anything it distorts reality. And, and there are some good places where you can find actual information, but you have to, you have to look for them. They're not in your face. They, they, they are hidden, if you will. So, so I think um, 
the, the media doesn't accurately describe the, the Latinos or the Hispanic community. First of all, as she was saying before, we're not all the same, we're very different. Um, and I think often the people that are portrayed on TV are a recent immigrants or people that uh, have jobs that don't require any college degree or cheap labor jobs. Often you see maids and last landscapers. Um, they also tend to portray more like dark skinned people, uh, people with huge families, uh, and people that are that are very uh, in touch with he, his or with their um, Latino culture and maybe not so much with the American culture. I think in my experience, I have preserved a lot of my culture, but I have also adopted a lot of American uh, uh, cost, uh, um, traditions. And for, for my kids, I am making sure we include both. Um, at least I try. Um, so I think um, I think that needs to change. I think uh, for most people that have not been in contact with Latinos, whatever you see on TV, you think that's the case for everyone. So I think the the media has a very powerful, a, a very important responsibility. Um, so I think they should be more conscious about. Uh, the, the people they uh, portray, it's, it's kind of like portraying the homosexual community, like usually they pick very flamboyant characters. Um, so I think one thing we can do as consumers is uh, support programs that uh, portray different kinds of Latinos. I know, for example, the show Grey's Anatomy, there's a doctor that she's Hispanic, born in the U.S., um, and she's also a lesbian, so that would be pretty different from what you expect, right, from a Latino woman. Um, so I think you can support those shows, and I think also companies should try to advertise in those top type of shows and not advertise on the shows that promote very stereotypical uh, images of Latinos. Um, so that's my take on that. William, Marius opposite. I have some Spanish language channels in my cable and I don't think I have tuned into any one of them, not even once. <laughs> so um, I'm talking about the mainstream regular channels. They're stereotypical by nature and it's not just about Hispanics, it's about anybody. Um, I don't know, all Asians are smart, all Hispanics have 15 kids, all Italians are in the mafia, uh, so on and so forth. So it's part of the, well, hit you over the head with a two by four kind of what media does. And uh, I agree with you that what we need to do is support programming and support the breaking away from stereotypes. And it goes for everybody. It goes for gender, it goes for um, anything, race, sexual orientation, age, all sorts of things. But that is media in itself, and it, it's so vast and so diverse. So I don't think it's just Hispanics, it's the way media is. I don't think that I can add to any, any more. You know, I think that Anna and um, Everilis and Mario really, uh, they get to the point that really sometimes media, they don't even know what Hispanic or Latino means. We came from so many different cultures, you know, Latino, we came from South America, Central America, North America, so we are really mixed. And it's not about the food, what we eat, about, about the music, it's about who we are, really. And sometimes they don't know. And it's not true that all Hispanic women have 15 kids, that's not true. I have only two. Things. I know we have little time, so maybe I, I'll just link these two questions. The last question was, um, during your journey towards success, was there someone in your life you oh. consider a mentor, or what lessons did you learn 
that would pass to future generations. And I guess I'll just link this last question with, um, with the media, stereotypes. I agree that we have to break away from those stereotypes for sure. We see uh, in the media a lot of times um, Latinos portrayed as, uh, as criminals or having this type of background as well as Anna says with other um, or African Americans are also, are also um, next to Latinos in, in that group and, and that's a very sad uh, situation and something that we not only sad but it's a challenge for us. But also as educators, I think that we have this, um, this challenge, I think that is a very good challenge ahead of us to, uh, to educate and inform uh, from our experience, this diversity that we have within the, the Latino culture. You know? uh, as Anna was saying, we're very different. We have Asian, Hispanic, um, Black, Hispanic, uh, European, Hispanic, and we're white. Um, and even the language itself, in Peru, there's an important segment of the population that speaks that doesn't speak Spanish at home. For example, they speak Quechua. Uh, and with, they have indigenous background. And a lot of people don't know that. And that have, even though we have so many things in common, of course, in South America, one of the most important um, things we have in common, we've been colonized you know, by Spain and not all the countries, of course, like in Brazil, the case of Brazil. But we do share ven many, many important historical uh, processes but we have many differences that make us very unique. And, and that is, I think, a challenge for us in the future. And to end my participation in the panel, I would say that what is to pass on future generations, I think that from my experience, what I have been, um, I think, the happiest and uh, I find the most rewarding for me has been when I have found persons uh, throughout my life that have value me in my um, academic capacity, in my talents, in my values, my solidarity with the community I live with. Um, all those values, um, not only that they respect my degrees, because to be honest, like after completing a PhD, I realized that the collection of degrees not necessarily have the highest correlation with being very smart or a very good person, not necessarily. So um, there are many other things to value, and when a person value those things in in others, you know, it's it's a um, it's the best possible world for me. And I definitely am against seeing the world as color blind because yes, we all have. Um, the same rights, and, but we are very different. So if we acknowledge that diversity, we're in the best place. So maybe in just one or two words, um, what would you, um, what lesson would you want to pass on to future generations? Um, I just would like to say to any, any student, uh, not only Hispanic or Latino students, you know, uh, if one door opens, don't stop there. You know, just keep going, uh, be positive. Uh, there are, you are going to find or going to see um, that not every day, you know, it's gonna be like the best day, but you are going to find challenges in your life. You, you just have to overcome these challenges and uh, um, just keep going don't don't stop because one door closed because you know just keep going um, and keep studying and that's it that's my only advice that I can give you uh, for me it would be that your gender, your race, your ethnicity, uh, the place where you were born, those are all things that happen to you. That really is not what matters. What matters is what you do with what happened to you. So where do you take it is up to you. And yes, use where you started, but that's not where you're gonna end. So look at who you are, look at where you wanna be, and just 
go there. So, um, so not to repeat what they said, I, I think that um, lessons that I will pass my children specifically will be as, as a Latino, you will have access to opportunities uh, that maybe other people won't, scholarships and special programs, so do take advantage of that and don't feel like you are taking away that opportunity for somebody else because there's a reason those programs are in place. Plus, there's programs for different types of uh, groups or people as well. I also think that it's important as a person you uh, get to know other people with other backgrounds and other beliefs and, and really get to know what they think and who they are and what their experiences are and what matters most to them. I think that would be a very valuable asset for you, it, not only in your family but in your workplace. Um, I also think it's important that you try to network and belong to different organizations and clubs in whatever you are at, in your community and in your uh, place of study or work uh, because that will help you connect with other people um, and you, you often will find that people in leadership positions are always uh, prone to help you, they really want to help you succeed so also try to um, get yourself known and connect with those people. Um, and I think like if you have a very bad day or a very bad job experience, um, don't let that stop you. Um, take this opportunity to educate the person um, and try to be your best so that they can see that you are not who they think who they think you are. I think that's very important. It's also important not to get into the trap of trying to prove yourself to everyone you know because then you're gonna end up being exhausted. So really think about what's important to you, what do you value, and try to show those characteristics at work and in your community. Because if not, it could be too much of a burden. And last but not least. Yeah, I guess very briefly. So be compassionate, be a good listener, and, and be frugal uh, and in no particular order. You know, don't be wasteful. The next 20, 30 years uh, of this poor planet of ours uh, will reveal many things that we can't even imagine. So we need to be mindful of frugality, be compassionate for other people, and, and listen to other people. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Um, we're going to open it up now. Um, if any of you have any questions that you would like to ask our panelists, we have a few more minutes. Joyce? I followed you for the last 20 years, and I remember when you were in my class, et cetera, and you're right, you do have that personality that shines above the rest in any culture, it doesn't matter, it's Thais. But how do you think, how do you think you were received once you left the ESL classes and then you matriculated into the the, uh, what would you call them, the uh, non-ESL classes, the American-speaking kids classes, who, who, who are just kids. How was that for you? Were you accepted? Did you feel welcome? Did you feel confused? Did you get a headache? Um, when I, yeah, when I finished my ESL classes, I, you know, and I want to be accepted in the, uh, in the administration program so I can learn the terminology of the of my career, so I can get a job in that in that field. So at the beginning, I feel I was the only one a Spanish uh, student in that class, and I, yeah, I have some challenges with other students. But I worked so hard that I was I have to say it, I was like an A plus student in that class because I worked really hard for that. But I guess I do have challenges with other students trying to accept, you know, that I was what, Spanish and she's the, you know, an A-plus student. You know, how that happened? You know, you, you can hear those things, but, you know, you just let it go and you keep going. And I start, like, she mentioned um, joining clubs and meeting people and going to the gym and, 
you know, I start doing other activities here at BCC, and that's what I get involved with, you know, people knowing me. And, you know, even though that I was new, you know, here at the college and I was for another country, I started to join in the international club, I'm getting into the map day, I'm getting in dancing stuff, you know, the belly dancing, and so I want to meet people. And I was dancing. I was living my life here at BCC, dancing all over the places, so, <laughs> so I can meet people. So, you know, personality counts a lot. I was not a shy, I still not, so I was not a shy student, so I was just like doing stuff and trying to meet people and talking to people, and even though sometimes students like, like, what are you saying? And I said, uh, I repeat it again, you know? But yes, I think that your personality counts so much about how you become and, act and about achieving your goals. It has to do a lot with what do you want, you know, and your personality really. So that's why I get involved in the, uh, I overcome to belong to the BCC community and getting along with a lot of people and meeting other students. Um, Professor Mario has to excuse himself. He has to go teach a class. So let's give him a big hand. Thank you very much for being here. Um, any other questions for our other panelists? Don't be afraid. Bedford, so I have two parts. One is that they've done away with the bilingual programs and they feel that it's better to immerse the students into the culture to help them learn the language and the culture. So I was wondering if you think that bilingual programs are a hindrance or are helpful. And also the message of sending that a teacher's message is really powerful to students. A lot of students that don't speak English well and English is the second language, they're classified as special ed and handicapped. And some of them are very bright, they just don't have the language skills. So is there a way as, well, I'm only a sub, but even as a substitute or as a regular instructor, can you get that message that you're not special needs or you're not handicapped, you just have a challenge to overcome and how you help them overcome it? Very good questions. I, I think that what you shared about being in an ASL class with people that were doctors, lawyers, uh, had already big degrees, they're two very separate things. Being smart and being language handicapped are two very different things. And for as long as we put the two of them in the same box, we're doing a disservice to the students. When my daughter started at elementary school, her father wanted to label her as an ESL student, and I was hell no. All of her friends speak English. She speaks English. Yes, she was speaking Spanish at home because of him. But the reality is most of the ESL programs treat kids as if they are less than. And there are aberrations out there, like for example the state of New York until very recently, they allowed the students that were graduating high school to take the regents test in their native language. So they got a very high mark and then they went to college and they placed three levels down in ESL or developmental because they didn't have the language capacity. So are we doing those students a favor? Definitely not. So there's a lot of reform that has to happen. Bring it beyond the fact that lacking command of the language doesn't make you dumb. Thank you, Anna. Any other questions? Milton? No, not a question, just a comment. Sure. And I, I just want to congratulate all the panel and also people who were involved in, in preparing this. Uh, I want to thank you for your sharing your, your experiences with us because it's given us a lot of insight, I believe, to a lot of issues and, and conditions that, as they are in this country. And perception is very important. It's important that you not think or, or judge people based on the way they look or the way they sound because your, your, your perception of them is going to be wrong in most cases. You are all very accomplished and you've done a wonderful job here today so I just want to 
congratulate you. Thank you. Thank you. I actually have, I will throw a question for the, for the audience, sure. since we're being thrown questions. <laughs> I'll uh, throw them back. Uh, I will bother you were asked, what are the challenges as educators, as Latino? And I'm going to ask, what are your challenges? Uh, if you're a student or administrator, what are your challenges with working with uh, Latino? If any, if any, if any, if any, or or uh, an international, yeah, an international professor or worker. Who's going to answer that question? We have a lot of students here, yeah. so you want to speak? Yeah. I actually um, spent a month over the summer in Costa Rica volunteering in an orphanage. And for me, my biggest challenge was the language barrier. And I can imagine how it must have been for you guys having to learn it. Also, the culture shock. And I, I never really thought about it from other people's perspectives. Like, because for me, our culture is, like, I'm used to it. But I also spent time in India and in Costa Rica. And it was just adapting in the language barrier. It was very challenging. But I, I don't think that's it. Anybody else? My experience with uh, hasn't been uh, with Hispanic and, and, uh, and uh, Latin instructors. Uh, in fact, in engineering, we tend to get a lot of uh, Asian instructors. And the challenge primarily was that it was very difficult to understand. Uh, and the question I, I would ask you is, uh, how should a student handle? You know, how should a student handle the fact that you know they they either don't understand it or they don't? Um, and, it, it, and it has to do primarily with it. I would guess that it has to do primarily with it, the accent, but it may be more they just don't know. You know that they just and you know how, how what would you recommend to students to handle that in a, in a sensitive way, but at the same time you know don't to. Uh, um, you don't want students to sit back and, and, and not ask that question if they really don't understand something. And one of the things that, I will just comment very briefly, but one of the things that I always tell my students is that I won't feel offended if they ask me, if they, if they tell me I, they don't understand. And I think that's very important because a lot of students, are, of course, I, they're very respectful and they don't want to offend anybody, and that's not the case. I always, so, the rules from the very beginning that should be clear and that I'm not going to get offended. So trust, I think that's best. However, there's a little piece to add to that in my opinion, that is don't use the accent as a hiding spot for other things. For example, I used to teach chemistry and at times there would be the occasional student that would say, oh, it's your accent. No, it's that you didn't read the material, honey. I can get that. <laughs> so if, yes, be honest, Flag the accent if the accent is the problem, but don't use it to hide other things behind it because that doesn't live too long. I ask the student, uh, do you, the problem is because you don't understand what I explained in this class or because you didn't well prepared? And that's what I, I said, and you see me after class and then we talk about it. That's one of the things that I do. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much for being here this morning. This was wonderful, um, wonderful exchange of ideas. Thank you very much, uh, Andrelis.